Hello, welcome to this lecture. Uh, this is going to be the first lecture of a series of lectures on volcanoes. Everybody's favourite. Um, so, um, volcanoes are one of the uh, major geophysical hazards on Earth. So, think of things like volcanoes and, and earthquakes. Um, and they're very well studied. Um, and we're going to learn an awful lot about them uh, during this series of lectures. Uh, so here you can see in the opening slide um, an erupting volcano and you can see the molten rock coming out um, called lava. Um, so if you remember um, molten rock when it's underground we call magma and then when it reaches the surface we just change the name and we call it lava. Essentially it loses some of the gases uh, but it's essentially the same, same material. Okay, so we're going to go through, um, answer a few questions during this lecture. And we do this with uh, various hazards as well. You can do this with um, earthquakes or hurricanes or uh, and certainly volcanoes. Um, so we're only going to answer the first couple of questions during this lecture. So um, uh, to do with volcanoes, so we can ask what is the geologic process which um, results in a volcanic eruption or a volcano as a landform? Uh, where do they occur? Uh, they're not random, um, it's all to do with tectonics, as we'll see. Um, how bad is it? How, how bad a, a hazard is it? What, what risk does this pose? Um, so again, looking at the science, and we'll, we'll cover a bit of that um, in this lecture as well. And then the next lecture, how often uh, do volcanoes occur? We can work out from the, the history of a say, volcano, something called the recurrence interval, which is how uh, on average, how often does an eruption take place? Every 200 years, every 500 years, or even longer? Um, how can we forecast these, you know, these things which are potentially, you know, um, can cause death, um, uh, huge property um, um, destruction, etc. So um, you want to be able to forecast eruptions, so generally, so you can evacuate uh, the area around a volcano. And many people in some countries do live very, very close um, to volcanoes because of things such as a very organic soil, for example, on their flanks. Um, so they're great for actually for crops. You can get much higher yields of crops in, in countries like Indonesia, uh, for example, uh, 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 and Central America, um, growing crops on these fertile um, soils of volcanoes. Um, all right, how can we make a short term forecast? Um, we'll look at hazard maps later. And and what you can do about it essentially um, as a person, as a community, um, in terms of mitigating the risk. All right, um, so what's the geologic process? Let's start. Um, so it's all to do with uh, plate tectonics, essentially. Um, we need to create molten rock. And the way we do that is associated with plate tectonics. There's various ways you can make molten rock. One of the main principal ways is, like you see in this slide, so you here, uh, like you've learned um, learned in the lecture on plate tectonics, you, you see a subducting plate. Um, so here you see the oceanic lithosphere, the oceanic crust subducting beneath the continental lithosphere. And as it does so, it takes some of the seabed wet sediment down with it on the top of this uh, subducting plate. And that contains water, H2O. And water will actually uh, lower the melting point of the rocks um, on top in, in the upper mantle here, um, um, the presence of water. And once you lower the melting point um, and with the heat down here, you will create magma. And that magma will expand and then it will rise because it's low, low density now. And there's big plumes of magma and it works its way up through the lithosphere, something called assimilation and it assimilates, basically eats its way through the rocks. Most of it never reaches the surface. Um, it just cools down as these big igneous intrusions underground in gray here, but some of it will reach the surface and then you get a, a volcanic landform and volcanic eruptions. And for example, classic example in the United States is the Cascade Mountains in, in um, Washington state and into Oregon. And formed exactly from this process. Um, so it's all related to plate tectonics. Also, we'll see right at the end of uh, uh, this lecture, I'll mention a few of the other settings where you can get uh, magma being formed and um, volcanoes. Um, 
Okay, um, so here shows um, some magma. All volcanoes have a magma chamber, uh, as it's called, or magma reservoir beneath um, the land, or beneath the volcano. And you, here you can see a cycle that sometimes, especially um, some volcanoes, this is one um, we relates to the Hawaiian volcanoes, they go for a cycle of um, magma building up, causing lots of stresses in the rocks. You actually get uh, many small earthquakes, which we'll come back to on, that's one of the ways to predict a, uh, an, er an eruption um, causes a, a, an inflation of the actual mountain, sometimes by several meters. And again, another way to predict an imminent vol uh, volcanic eruption. And eventually um, you have an eruption. And then the hope that mountain, in this case, Hawaiian volcanoes uh, deflate down again uh, once this magma chamber uh, releases a lot of the, the lava. Okay, let's just look at the cl uh, classic case studies, uh, which hopefully you've all heard of, I hope. Uh, Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, uh, so the Mount St. Helens eruption uh, occurred back in 1980, May 18th, 1980, and it is the most destructive volcanic eruption to occur in North America in historic times over the last few centuries and occurred when Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington state. It's one of the chain of volcanoes in the Cascade Mountains. And the blast, when it occurred back, back in 1980, blew out the entire north flank of the mountain, of the volcano. Uh, as we'll see, um, it actually didn't erupt upwards. Um, it actually er erupted, um, part of it, the eruption, went uh, what was called a lateral blast, and it blew sideways. Um, and that's why caused uh, that's what caused the deaths at the time. I believe that something like 55 people lost their lives, um, which is quite a lot for a very very sparsely populated uh, forested area of Washington State. Um, and it caused huge areas of uh, destruction to the to the forest there. We'll see in some photos in a second. So the summit itself was lowered uh, more than 400 meters, or more than 1,300 feet. Um, prior to the eruption, Mount St. Helens, it's a, it's, a, it's a large mountain, was in in feet, it was 9,677 feet in elevation. Um, um, but after the eruption, it reduced to 8,300 feet. Um, trees within 400 square kilometers around the eruption lay flattened, especially from this, uh, this lateral blast where most of the eruption actually went sideways, basically when a large, um, um as basically what happened with um as the the mountain was inflating and that the lava was still corked in uh within the vent under under the mountain uh there was a large landslide on one side of the um of the volcano and that large landslide basically uncorked the eruption and the eruption instead of going straight upwards which is what was expected uh it went sideways and caused uh you know ground level <laughs> so it caused a lot of uh, destruction. Uh, associated with the um, eruption were things called um, mud flows, volcanic mud flows. There's a special word for that which we'll cover in the next lecture called lahar, L-A-H-A-R, uh, carried debris some 18 miles uh, down the rivers. Uh, claimed the lives of 59 lives. Uh, the eruption itself ejected nearly a cubic kilometre of ash and rock debris into the atmosphere. Some ash was repelled more than 18,000 meters or 11 miles into the stratosphere and it was actually once you get up into there those high uh, altitude winds was carried right around the world at the time which is why this ash in the atmosphere these very large eruptions can actually change climate uh, for a while and um, these particles um, in the atmosphere uh, so why was the big question we'll answer this in a second why was uh, Mount St. Helens so explosive it was a very explosive, uh, violent type of eruption. Some eruptions, if you go to Hawaii in the Pacific Ocean, uh, those islands are very tame, if you will, very um, unexplosive, not violent. Um, basically, you have lava coming out, but you don't get the explos explosivity of an eruption. A very different style of eruption, and you can actually go up quite close to, say, Kilauea on Hawaii, the most active volcano on the planet, Kilauea, been erupting since the 1980s you know so 30 35 years or so it's been constantly erupting uh, but you can go on guided tours 
why is there opting? Uh, you couldn't do that with Mountain Helens. Um, um, and we'll learn why. It's all to do with the nature of the magma, the chemistry of the magma. So here's a picture of Mountain Helens before the eruption. Beautiful mountain. You can see the high. You know, I said that the altitude, uh, almost 10,000 feet, um, um, almost 3,000 meters. And here you can see because of that high altitude, snow on the top, you know, it gets colder with, with elevation increase. And the classic, you know, snow topped conical volcano and um, all these lovely forests around it around it, the giant um, uh, Douglas fir trees. And to locate you, um, the top right shows um, uh, here, um, Seattle, Washington State, and there's Mount St. Helens labeled uh, north of that, um, also another active volcano, Mount Rainier. Okay. Um, after the eruption, that was before, on May 18th, 1980, there you go, 1300 feet of that mountain completely disappeared. Here we're looking towards where the lateral blast would have come towards towards us here um, and devastated the landscape around. Um, and you can actually see a small um, something called a lava dome, which we'll come back to uh, forming within the within the crater again. Um, so yeah, that's before and after there of this very very large eruption of Mount St Helens. Uh, here's an image of the lateral blast and what it did to the um, these Douglas fir trees, and these are huge trees, and they just, you know, fells like matchsticks uh, from this lateral blast. It shows the energy um, of, of this eruption uh, when it came out. You see the large trunks are just simply shredded. Um, and an image of Mount St. Helens eruption here. Uh, you can see the large um, eruption column. So it still has a vertical eruption column element to it, but also a very uh, distinct um, uh, lateral blast uh, going off to one side here. Um, what after one part of that mountain actually uh, at the large landslide gave way, and the direction of the um, the blast uh, went went sideways, if you will. Very good. I'm, we're not going to watch it now, but I'd ask, I'll please ask ask you you guys to watch this. Um, and it's about seven minutes long. Uh, very well put together. A uh, little documentary about the Mount St. Helens eruption uh, produced by the USGS, which is the US Geological Survey, uh, done by USGS personnel, uh, many of the people who were there at the time. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's some great footage of the, of the eruption uh, and just afterwards as well, and, and the story that led up to it. Okay, so that's, that's Mount St. Helens. Where else do volcanoes occur? Uh, can you think of any? Uh, I mentioned Hawaii, that, that'd be one place. Um, so Hawaii, famous for its volcanoes, like I say, Kilauea. There's two main active volcanoes on Hawaii. There's Mauna Loa, uh, which is kind of the larger in size, and there's Kilauea, a younger volcano, which is actually the most active, and it's the most active volcano on Earth at the moment. Mount St. Helens, where else? Well, if we look at map, the next slide we'll see most volcanoes are located along plate boundaries, the vast majority of uh, are located along especially subduction zones so convergent plate boundaries where you as we saw in that earlier slide where the subducting plate and we have magma uh, generation uh, a few are are in what we call intraplate uh, areas so they're away from the plate boundaries and these are associated um, with hot spots um, the famous hot spot uh, below hawaii uh, and magma magma plumes rising there and that hence the uh, volca volcanoes of Hawaii, but also sometimes in the interior of continents, um, such as in Yellowstone, in Wyoming, uh, and neighboring states. And you have a lot of uh, volcanic act activity out there in, in Yellowstone. You may have heard the, uh, the famous uh, geyser, um, uh, Old Faithful, uh, the, the superheated water which comes up due to the heating up from uh, volcanic activity underground. So here's a map of uh, most of the uh, active volcanoes on Earth. And you can see, hopefully, if I um, take, show the marker here, all the way around the Pacific Ocean, you see most of them are actually located in the Pacific Rim. And we call that the Ring of Fire, it's topically known as. And you can see why. I always think of the, uh, the, the Johnny Cash song <laughs> when, when I look at this, when I hear that phrase, Ring of Fire. Um, but yeah, so you can see a chain of, and they're all related mainly to do with uh, this ring of fire with uh, subduction zones, because the Pacific Ocean is kind of ringed by, or most of it, 
uh, by subduction zone zones and convergent plate boundaries uh, and it's shown by this um, this annotation of the, 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 the filled triangles here so you can see all the way up the, the west coast of America you have that chain of volcanoes east of the subduction zone uh, which essentially makes the uh, the Andes mountain range and up through Central America also uh, associated with subduction zones. There's a small one around the Pacific um, sorry the Caribbean by the way the Caribbean you, you have active volcanoes um, um, and Montserrat is a famous uh, active volcanic island there, but and there are others, and they have their own small subduction zone there. Up to further up the west coast, there's a gap due to that transform fault boundary, uh, so there's no volcanoes for a little while uh, in Southern California. And uh, there, but then you go further north into the Cascade Mountains, up into Canada slightly, and then the whole chain of active volcanoes through the Aleutian Islands, again associated with the subduction zone, come down through Kamchatka in eastern Russia. And then into Japan again, subduction zone, volcanism, uh, and magma generation. And then there's a, a various, a bit more complex where the, the, um, these deep sea trenches are and subduction zones, but there's various boundaries in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, in the Philippines, and places like near Guam. And then again, Micronesia, and into uh, very active ones um, in New Zealand as well, active volcanoes. But you see, there are a few. Intraplate ones. Here's Mauna Loa and Kilauea on Hawaii. It's not shown here, but there's also volcanism in um, interior of, of, of the North American plate in Yellowstone. Um, but also ones you see this chain. Uh, there's a few anyway red spots um, on mid-ocean ridges, and you get some volcanism uh, often under the sea. You don't see the actual uh, um, lava being emitted, but it's happening. Um, and some of it where you do have islands such as Iceland. Um, some famous volcanic eruptions, uh, quite recent ones as well, um, up there in Iceland. Uh, closer to home in the United States here, you can see uh, more detail of where the volcanoes are. So the red dots and here they show them, if you read the key, the volcanoes with a short term eruption periodicity or um, so recurrence interval of, of 100 to 200 years or thereabouts there in red. So every couple of centuries, these erupt, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, Mount Baker, Mount Hood, these are all very active volcanoes. Uh, the purple ones, the eruption periodicities of up to a thousand years. So things like Mount Adams, uh, for example, um, Mount Jefferson. Again, they haven't erupted for many a long time, but they do erupt. They're still classified as, as active. And other ones, volcanic centers greater than 10,000 years. Uh, you might not think they're active, but the USGS <laughs> classifies them as active. Um, um, these are when they do grow up. So in these very, um, when they only generally the rule of thumb is if it doesn't erupt for a long time, it's going to be a big eruption when they do grow up. Uh, so you can here see there's especially a famous uh, one, a caldera type eruption, which we'll come on to in this lecture. Um, what calderas? Um, the Long Valley caldera of Southern California, or sort of the mid part of California, and Yellowstone as well. Okay, so we're going to come back to this in the next lecture of all the different processes that essentially how volcanoes kill you. Uh, so think of the word eaglet and go through the letters. So through explosions, volcanic bombs and debris, ash, it's a hazard to aircraft, it can cause building collapse and ash building up, it can cause volcanic mud flows from uh, water and ash mixing, uh, volcanic gases, poisonous gases, pyroclastic flows, these very lethal uh, superheated um, basically um, avalanches of, of gas, superheated gas and, and ash, which rush down the side of the um, volcanoes. Again, we'll, we'll talk about these next lecture. Um, and there's lava itself, which you know of temperature typically around about sort of 1100 Celsius. And uh, earthquakes, uh, can uh, many small earthquakes can occur due to inflation and deflation of um, a volcanic eruption and the energy released during a the eruption. And also tsunami, some volcanic Eruptions take place on volcanic islands. I'll mention at the end of this lecture a place called Krakatoa. So if you've heard of it, famous eruption from the late 1800s in Indonesia, um, and that caused a, a huge tsunami, which which caused most of the deaths. I mean, like 30,000 people died from that tsunami. Uh, basically, tsunamis displacement of the water and causes this rippling effect, and um, generally from earthquakes, but also volcanic eruptions uh, can also displace the water and cause this tsunami wave. Uh, that's the Mount St. Helens eruption, very violent eruption, like we said. What makes an eruption explosive? So let's get down to the science of it. Um, 
So it's all to do with two properties um, in the magma, essentially, and which in turn, as we'll see, is, is related to tectonic setting, where if it's oceanic crust or is it continental crust or is it a mixture at the, at the transition, the boundary. Anyway, um, within magmas, uh, you can think of things about how much gas is within the magma, uh, that often usually called volatiles, uh, dissolved gases within the molten rock, and also the viscosity of the magma and the ensuing lava. So the viscosity means essentially how sticky is it, how easy it, is it or, or, or not easy to flow. Um, so viscosity is a measure of the material's resistance to flow. It's a really key word uh, to do with a property of magma and, and lava. And um, the more viscous it is, the more explosive an eruption it is. So something like a, a low visc, so think of honey, you know, a jar of honey, um, if it's uh, quite cold, you know, cold honey, um, and you just put that jar on its side, it'll very, very slowly, it's really sticky still, flow out of an open jar, very, very slowly, that, that we have a high viscosity. If you were to heat that jar of honey, you know, above a heat source, uh, it becomes much more liquid, if you will, and then you, you put that jar of honey on its side, it, it flows out quite easily, as much more liquid, that would be low viscosity. Um, so know the three V's of volcanic eruptions, viscosity, which I've just mentioned, uh, volatiles, which is the dissolved gases, uh, common ones are uh, water vapour, H2O and carbon dioxide, um, and volume, basically how, how big a, a magma chamber we're we talking about, it's, it's empty. Uh, so vol volcanic gases, they're the things as they uh, come out, where they're released once the lava, the magma reaches the surface, that's what drives the eruption. So gases will expand uh, within a magma as it nears the Earth's surface due to decreasing pressure. So they've been kept under lots of pressure underground, they get to the surface and there's a lot, a huge decrease in pressure and that allows that gases to expand and that drives a very volcanic eruption if there's more gases doing that. Think of a busy, you know, soda bottle, carbonated water bottle, and you, you unscrew the tap, uh, especially if you're sh shaking it, and it all froths out. Uh, it's the same principle, essentially. Uh, more gas within the lava, more explosive eruption, and different types of rock, different types of magma have varying degrees of gases within them. Viscosity determines the ferocity of the eruption, so the gases kind of keep driving and keep it going, but how, um, how, how that event is, how explosive it is, it's really to do with how sticky or runny the lava is, so how, the viscosity. Uh, so runny fluid lava, rule of thumb, gentle eruption, like in Hawaii, a thick viscous lava, explosive eruption, like Mount St. Helens as an example. What in turn though actually controls viscosity? Well, a couple of factors, firstly temperature, some magmas are hotter, uh, so hotter magmas are less viscous, so therefore less viscous, less explosive. So if you have hotter magmas, uh, they're more runny. But importantly, this is, this is the most important thing, um, is the composition of the magma, and especially the content of this, this uh, compound called silica, silica oxide. So the silica content is the primary control on viscosity of a magma. And the more silica within the chemistry of, you know, the makeup of that magma, the higher the viscosity, the more stick sticky it is. The lower the silica content, the lower viscosity. So higher, higher, lower, lower. That's how I, or I, I, how I remember it. Um, higher silica content, higher viscosity. Lower silica content, lower viscosity. And um, le less explosive eruptions, etc. So here's the kind of summary diagram of a lot of that. On the right, you'll see um, increasing in the yellow arrow, increasing explosivity as you go up. And we'll be mentioning some of these volcano types soon, shield volcanoes, um, or kind of the low explosivity type of volcano. Then you go through something called strata volcanoes. And then finally, the very explosive caldera type um, of eruption. And relating to that increasing explosivity, what's really controlling it or drives it is here on the blue, increasing silica content. And you go for various rock types associated with these eruptions. So basalt, very dark black rock, is very um, mafic, it's called in chemistry, and has very much less relatively silica. As you go to these lighter rocks, um, uh, such as rhyolite, uh, I'll put some, some rhyolite here, you can see on camera. So this pink lava, essentially, if you compare that to the, the black, uh, basalt lava, black on, on the other side here. Um, the pink has a very high 
silica content. Silica is essentially quartz. If you think of that white mineral quartz, that's essentially pure silica. So there's a lot of quartz mineral, which is silica, in a rhyolite, but very little quartz, um, and therefore very little silica within a bath salt, for example. And somewhere in between, the grey one, I've got all three here, if I can line them up and somehow show them on camera, I will. Let's try, I need another pair of hands, really. Um, is the middle one here is this greyish one, is something called andesite. So, um, high silica, um, rhyolite, intermediate type of silica, level of silica, so sort of medium type explosivity, um, andesite rock, and then the black um, basalt rock, basalt, uh, which is low silica, and you get all these rock types associated with the different volcanoes here. Increasing volatiles as well as you get through these different types of rocks as well. Increasing gases get more explosivity as well. And you can see the, uh, the increasing viscosity to, to what I, my analogy I just gave, cold honey of the very viscous um, rocks or magma. Okay, so just to show you that, um, actual lava flows, here you can see a low viscosity lava flow on a Y. Uh, you can hear, see it's coming actually out of a lava tube um, from underground essentially, and basically it's just like someone's turned the tap and it's coming out actually into the Pacific Ocean here. It's making a small mound of rock here, but here's the ocean waves of the Pacific. Here, um, again on Hawaii, some of, some, of the, some of the lava flows are more viscous in Hawaii, and you can see um, this kind of tumbling, cascading, blocky type of a lava flow. Again, we'll talk about these uh, in the next lecture, um, but this is much more viscous, less runny, if you will. Uh, so the lava types and silica content. Uh, so you can see some pie charts here with uh, different uh, varying um, uh, amounts of silica in SiO2. So the saltic ones, kind of 50% more in, in andesitic rocks, and then even, even more in the rhyolitic rocks uh, with the very high viscosity. So here, three types of lava for low silica content, basaltic, very runny, uh, medium silica content, andesitic rocks, typically fall in places like the Cascade Mountains, um, plate boundaries, very thick um, uh, lava flows, and then the very high silica content form rhyolitic lava flows. These generally form you near know, hot spots, continental hot spots, such as Yellowstone, and really thick, very viscous lava, very explosive when they have, need an awful lot of pressure to uncork um, this lava and, and have this ex explosive eruption. Uh, three rock types, um, so which, which, uh, which rock formed the most viscous lava was generally um, the lighter the color, um, it's where well, it is always the, the lighter the color, um, that the more silica, the more quartz, therefore less, um, more silica means less viscous. So, um, which form, um, sorry, the other way around there. <laughs> um, more silica, as I've just said, is more viscous, therefore more explosive. So which rock formed the most viscous lava? The one on the right, see. Uh, the, the granite or the rhyolite lava flow. Uh, the other rock names, um, the label on the right is a lava flow, the one on the left is when the rock type when it's underground. For, so basalt, the black rock, and then the andesite or diorite if it's underground, one in the middle. Put those all together into kind of context with plate tectonics we talked about uh, in the last lecture, and you'll see uh, mixing with the uh, continental uh, crust basically. So um, you, where it's only where magma is only mainly sourced from the kind of the upper mantle and the and oceanic crust, you get a very dark basalts forming in places like Hawaii, forming shield volcanoes, uh, which we're going to talk about soon. Types of volcano um, and very low viscosity and low silica content. The other extreme, where it's mainly just molten um, uh, magma sourced from continental lithosphere, continental crust, you get the rhyolitic lavas, places like um, Yellowstone in the United States, in North America, and again, very viscous, high silica, very viscous. Somewhere in between where you mix the two, it's a mixing of continental and oceanic crust together, and the magma there is a mixture of the two, and you get this intermediate type of magma, and that's where you get the andesitic um, lava flows. All right, so in summary, again, uh, basaltic lavas, Mild eruptions, good example, Kilauea volcano on Hawaii, granitic uh, or andesitic or, uh, lavas, uh, explosive eruptions, e.g. Mount St. Helens in Washington state. Okay, so, uh, and there's two examples, or, um, a, uh, a rhyolitic, uh, sorry, a, a very um, 
fluid lava flow on so uh, basaltic lava, so low viscosity. You can see this lava stream coming down the flanks of, in this case, Kilauea volcano. Um, so you say, oh, it might, it looks explosive. <laughs> I thought you said that this, these were explosive. Yes, you can get this kind of lava fountain, as they're called, in the crater here. Sometimes they're along fissures as well. Um, but note, blue sky behind. There is no big clouds of plumes of ash and debris being, you know, exploded into the atmosphere like you do with Mount St. Helens type eruptions. Um, so, you know, this, this helicopter, there's a bit of perspective going on, but it's relatively close. Uh, that wouldn't happen during a, a, a Mount St. Helens type eruption. And you can see the stream of lava going down with very low viscosity. Uh, very explosive eruption. So, um, an example here on um, the other side of the Pacific, in this case, New Zealand. Uh, so, so the Mount uh, Ruapea um, volcano, a very active volcano. Um, and here you can see after a very large eruption column of ash uh, and debris erupting down, up, and here's the, uh, the, the ash um, uh, falling to earth um, downwind of, of the eruption. So that would be a very, something from a very viscous type magma, uh, this, this eruption. Okay, we're going to go on to the next stage of this talk and now talk about uh, mainly actually the main topic for the rest, the second half of the lecture, uh, which is on the types of volcano. We're going to go through the different types. Uh, we're going to go through four main types of volcano and then a, two other kind of add-on ones, kind of rarer events, but they often very large um, eruption styles when they do happen. Uh, so firstly, um, shield volcanoes. So shield volcanoes are these broad, slightly dome-shaped volcanoes. They're called shield volcanoes um, after, actually, um, because they're common in, in the Pacific, after Hawaiian uh, shields, sort of warrior's shields, very broad in uh, the, the shape of them. Um, and here you can see an example in the Pacific in the, the Galapagos Islands, uh, the Fernandina um, volcano. Uh, we'll see other images of the ones in Hawaii, like Mauna Loa. For example, have a very similar outline, and it's not your typical, maybe what you think of a volcano. You know, the, the typical conical type. These are much, much more broader in relief, so cover, but they cover large areas. And key thing to remember, they actually form the largest volcanoes in terms of volume of, of, of a, as a landform, as a mountain, as a volcano. These are by, by far and away the largest in volume shield volcanoes. They're composed of layer upon layer upon layer of thin lava flows, thin running lava flows, building it up with time. Hence the gentle slopes as well because of this runny nature of the lava. Um, produced by mild eruptions of large volumes of this fluid basaltic lava. A good example is Mauna Loa on Hawaii. So there's an image of Mauna Loa, a photo at the top of Mauna Loa. And here's a, a kind of a, 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 a diagram of the main island of, of Hawaii, most of it taken up by Mauna Loa. And Mauna Loa is actually the, the largest mountain on Earth, higher than Everest if you actually go to the seabed to the elevation, about 33,000 feet. Um, but you can see layer upon layer of different material. Um, basically, it's, it's um, different different lava flows, sorry, uh, one after the other. There's a magma chamber, like all active volcanoes beneath it, the main uh, summit, uh, summit craters, and also smaller eruptions occur. Here you can see on the map on the right the, the, the main volcanoes of, of um of Hawaii, some of these not active very more uh, anymore, the ones in the northwest, but the main active ones are Mauna Loa and now especially now Kilauea. Uh, in cross-section, comparing, showing how shield volcanoes are much bigger than other types of volcanoes we'll consider. So here's uh, Mauna Loa on the top. It uh, might not look that high, but actually in elevation, it almost gets as high as these other types, such as um, Mount Rainier type of um, volcanoes or Mount, Mount St. Helens in the, in the Cascade Mountains. And that, these are called composite cones. So we'll come on to these, these in a second. Uh, these are your typical classic kind of, you know, conical shaped volcano. And we'll also consider another type of volcano, a much smaller type called cinder cones. And as I mentioned before, Mauna Loa itself is, you know, it's, it's, as, as a landmass, is it's, um, it's higher than Everest if you go all the way from the seabed um, up to the summit. Uh, shield volcanoes are very basaltic lava, low silica, low, low viscosity, so they produce lots of lava and relatively little tephra. Tephra or pyroclastics are basically fire fragments and material ejected out of, 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 a, of an explosive eruption. They don't produce that so much. Um, and they often sometimes have fissures occurring along them as well, fissure type eruptions. So here you can see what's called a lava curtain on Kilauea. Here you can see a lava flow. 
uh, on the bottom right here, um, um, on Mauna Loa, uh, you can see the red hot lava, you know, it's sort of 1000 degrees Celsius, uh, nearly 2000 Fahrenheit. Um, and you can see quickly cools, and you can see this black kind of skin, this, this crust forming on top um, as it cools at the surface first. But you can see people in the background, um, you know, that if you could zoom in there, they're in, you know, shorts and sneakers. Uh, um, they're basically going on, they're, they're pretty safe to walk by this, this, this lava flow. Obviously, you don't want to stand in it. <laughs> you might lose your foot. Um, but it's pretty, pretty safe to, to walk close by. Okay, the second type of the four types of volcanoes are cinder cones. Quite small in, in size, these cone shaped with large summit uh, uh, craters. So the crater at the top where the, 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 the active vent emerges and what sometimes explodes off during the eruption and it creates this depression, basically, to depression at the top of the volcano. They are very large. Uh, cinder cones are very large summit craters compared to the size, um, relative to the size. They're built from ejected lava, basically lumps of lava thrown out, or, um, or, or cinders. Um, the analogy often is in sort of textbooks is, or I've heard in lectures, um, popcorn makers. So if you think of a popcorn maker, all those bit popcorns, you know, um, exploding upwards. Very similar if you if you watch a cinder cone uh, during its, during during an eruption. They're very steep slope angles due to kind of the nature of these quite large cinders. They can sustain a steep angle uh, on the flanks of the volcano. Pretty usually small in size, usually less than a thousand feet in height. Often, sometimes you get groups of them. They're actually fed underground from a single magma chamber, and then you get various vents which feed to the surface with several um, volcanic cones, in this case, cinder cones at the surface. Here's a, a diagram of one. You can see it's basically 100% made of pyroclastic cinders, uh, these pyroclastic materials. Pyroclastic literally means fire fragment coming out. You can see typical cinders or a rock type called scoria. Um, the light colored version of that um, is something called pumice stone you may be familiar with. Um, so it's very, very porous, got lots of air bubbles in, basically quite sort of um, frothy lock, uh, lava fragments uh, being thrown around this, this pumice. Um, here's an example, uh, this is SP crater in Arizona. You can see the very large crater compared to the relative to the size of uh, the cone. Um, quite steep sides, um, and it's all mainly made up of pyroclastic cinders. Uh, also, you can see in the background, this is actually a lava flow. Sometimes they have lava flows which emit not from the top, often from fissures at the base of the cone um, during the later stages of the eruption. Uh, SP crater is thought to have formed, has been dated to around 55,000 years ago. So this hasn't been, this hasn't erupted in a long time. It's uh, um, um, uh, in Arizona. So last last erupted 55,000 years ago. Uh, a famous example of a uh, SP, of a of a cinder cone. Uh, it's in all the textbooks. Always this example. I, I remember it from my first lecture on volcanoes. Um, and it's um, as a student. And this is um, the volcano um, called the Paracutan uh, cinder cone. It's in Mexico. And uh, this erupted back in or the eruption started back in 1943. So it's located uh, in a village or near a village uh, west of Mexico City. And back in 1943, this cinder cone originated from a small depression in a cornfield. So there was a farmer's field, essentially, growing corn. Um, and there was a small depression there. The farmer always noticed it, didn't think of anything of it. Then one day it collapsed in and <laughs> pyroclastics, uh, you know, molten lava started being ejected out. And it built up very, very quickly. It was 300 feet tall in just in five days and then kept on growing so it was almost a thousand feet eventually and at the later stages there was um, basalt lava flows very thick blocky lava flows came through and engulfed the local village and one of the only buildings surviving was, was a church here uh, with these uh, thick lava flows around it in this photograph that's, that's the paracutan cinder cone um, third of the fourth domes uh, volcanic domes um, these are very, very, very thick, viscous uh, lava, and they're often quite small. Uh, they often just call lava domes. And sometimes, often, these things actually form within the volcano. For example, this photo at the bottom is a lava dome forming within the crater of the Mount St. Helens uh, volcano, which is actually something called a, a composite cone or a stratovolcano. So it's within this larger volcano, we have this small dome. 
uh, created this thick, viscous lava produces a steep sided, small volcanic dome. A bit of a minor player of the four. The, the two big ones, I would say, are the um, the the shield volcano and the next one, the final one, the strata volcano. So the last one, strata volcano, uh, more commonly now called the composite cone, but the same thing. Uh, composite because it's actually a mixture, composite of lava and pyroclastic. So most are located adjacent to the Pacific Ocean on that ring of fire. Um, they were very much associated with subduction zones on the Rio Fire. For example, Mount St. Helens on the east in the Cascades. If you go to Japan on the west of the Pacific, Mount Fuji um, in Japan. Um, a large, classic, conical-shaped volcano. If you think of a volcano, I think, when you, when you see an image like this in the top right. Uh, composed of interbedded lava flows and pyroclastics. So in other words, during this eruption cycle, you have both lavas, lava flows coming out and explosive pyroclastics and ash being thrown out and that comes back down to earth and you get layer upon layer in the bedded of lava and pyroclastics. Um, magma derived from the melting of granitic continental crust, or it's actually a continental crust and a mixture of the, the descending um, oceanic crust as well, um, and you get uh, this very viscous lava, high silica content. Most violent type of eruptions uh, for example, um, looking in Europe, Mount Vesuvius uh, was the one responsible for Pompeii in ancient Rome. You know, uh, buried the ancient um, Roman town of Pompeii in around about 70 AD. Um, and they include pyroclastic flows. And again, we'll talk about them in the next lecture when we talk about the types of, kind of products of volcanoes. And these are lethal, superheated avalanches of of gas and ash which rush down the flanks of volcanoes and basically are, they're, they're deadly. <coughs> uh, an image of a, a, a composite cone, this is Mount Fujiyama or, or simply Mount Fuji in, in Japan. Again you can see the high elevation from the snow at the top. Uh, a, a diagram of one, composite cone um, and you can see the interbedded nature of lava then pyroclastic then lava then pyroclastics mainly pyroclastics for the lighter colour here. A uh, famous example recently uh, 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 where composite cones are you know, active is in Montserrat in the um, in, in the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean chain of islands, especially around the east of the Caribbean, a very volcanic islands associated with the subduction zones. So you get these subduction zone earth uh, volcanoes, which very much are typically the, uh, uh, the um, stratovolcano type. Um, this has been erupting, you know, for several decades intermittently now and again, and um, it's been active certainly since the mid-80s, 1985, and uh, a pyroclastic flow uh, has destroyed the airport in the capital city uh, a few years ago, and basically over the last couple of decades, about two-thirds of the population have left this island. It's just too hazardous to live on uh, Montserrat, and most of them, uh, those people have, have emigrated to uh, the United States, actually. Um, other types of eruption, I mentioned they're the main four, but other, other ones are much bigger sometimes in volume of material being being erupted, um, but they're much rarer. So fissure type eruptions, long fissures, but something that, that produce something called flood basalt. So you can see in a diagram, there's a very large fissure eruption, so it's not from a central cone um, and crater, it's a large crack in the, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the earth essentially, and a fissure, and you get these large, very fluid basalt lava flows coming out um, and produce large uh, lava plateaus which are large you know flat lying areas of ground mountains um, such as the Clim Columbia River Plateau so I mentioned two examples of these ancient ones so the Columbia River Plateau um, occurred uh, was created 17 million years ago and you see the darker grey um, at the top of this diagram, that's the Columbia River basalt, it's covering an area of something like 80,000 square, mi square miles. Um, this is from a very large, long-lasting um, uh, fissure-type uh, flood basalt eruption uh, around about 17 million years ago. Huge, um, long-lasting eruption. Also here on this diagram is the Yellowstone caldera um, in northwest Wyoming, um, and um, that volcanic hotspot um, there. Um, not, I haven't got any slides on this, but I should mention another famous um, uh, flood basalt type eruption is happened in India, what's called the Deccan Plateau, D-E-C-C-A-N, or sometimes called the Deccan Traps. 
And these are again huge flood basalts, um, probably lot, much larger than the Columbia River basalts, occurred 66 million years ago. Originally, we thought they actually might be associated with the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs before uh, the, um, the, uh, the asteroid theory kind of came into being. Because um, it's not long before the dinosaurs um, um, went extinct, about a million years before. And it certainly did cause some extinctions, this, this one event. Um, anyway, it, it covers now um, 1.2 million cubic kilometers of material was ejected, now covering around about 500,000 square kilometers. Uh, probably double that when it initially happened. Um, and again, it's caused by these Deccan traps are caused by a hotspot of volcanism um, at the time, 66 million years ago. All right. Um, so there's it going, going back to the Columbia River plat, uh, basalt. Uh, here you can see if you were to fly over, I don't know if any of you have been to this part of, the, of Washington State, but uh, you, if you flew over, you'd see this sort of landscape. You see these. Um, these plateaus, these mesa landforms, but these you can see the layer upon layer of this black, black, dark basaltic lava flows. That's what these layers are. They're ancient lava flows covering huge areas. Some of it's been eroded away, but some of it's still preserved, um, even though it's 17 million years old in Washington state there. OK, finally, uh, caldera type eruptions. Uh, these are the most explosive type of eruptions one can have, <laughs> essentially. Um, and these are where the caldera itself is a steep wall depression at the summit, generally greater than one kilometer in diameter. If it's less than one kilometer, less than one kilometer, we generally call that a crater. If it's larger than one kilometer in diameter, we call it this depression a caldera or caldera, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so here, um, and they're produced by collapse following a massive eruption. So I said, remember, all volcanoes have the magma chamber underneath them. Sometimes these magma chambers are huge, and sometimes during just one event, typically during an eruption, not all of that, that magma chamber is evacuated you know, as, as, a, as, an, as lava. Only a small portion of that magma chamber is, is kind of released. Sometimes most of it, or large content of it, is released, and you end up this huge void, essentially cavern, underground. Once that lava's come out, then the whole thing collapses in, in on itself, and you get this big, wide depression called a caldera, uh, here's an example up in the Aleutian Islands, the uh, uh, Anayakchak caldera in Alaska. This one around about sort of 10 kilometers in diameter uh, uh, from an eruption that took place, we think of what's been dated three and a half thousand years ago, uh, producing this uh, very large explosive eruption when it when it took, took went off as well. Uh, here shows two looking down from space uh, um, aerial photographs that look down and you can see one looking down at Mount Vesuvius in Italy and you can see if I show the marker here the small crater around about uh, 0.5 of a kilometer in diameter at the top of Mount Vesuvius still still you know a very active volcano um, and produced the the devastation of Pompeii buried the ancient Roman town of Pompeii in classical Rome in AD 79. Um, Mount Tambora actually a much more violent eruption I mean, Mount Vesuvius was very, very um, uh, violent, but this is Mount Tambora is in uh, Indonesia and it's counted as the most explosive eruption in history, caused something like 92,000 deaths in 1815. Here it's a caldera type of eruption, six kilometer wide, uh, the depression, the caldera itself, and the whole thing collapsed in itself after a huge eruption uh, took place. Okay, uh, another famous example of a caldera eruption uh, coming back to the United States. Here is Crater Lake in Oregon, formed uh, around about 7,000 years ago. Um, the ancient volcano, it's not really there, there, but we've given a name, Mount Mazama. Uh, this is Mount Mazama. Then a large part of it was um, evacuated during the eruption, huge cavity there for underground, a void that all collapsed in uh, after this massive eruption, and you have this large depression is caldera being formed as well and a small um wizard uh, actually a small cone starting to form again called wizard island <laughs> which i think is very harry, harry potter um um it was in the lake now there's a visitor i've never been there but there's a visitor center if you ever get to go out here which tells you all about it um beside cradle lake uh put the, all these volcanoes uh, i think we've mentioned just about all these now on this on this diagram uh, so I'll let you kind of go through that. So it starts with the volcano type from 
kind of low viscosity flood basalts and shield volcanoes through increasing uh, viscosity uh, and violence, as it says on the left there, to the caldera eruptions uh, at the bottom. Uh, characteristics and then different examples from uh, around the world of these types in some diagrams. Uh, famous eruptions, I'll just to finish, I'll, I'll mention a couple of historic famous ones. Uh, here is a, a newspaper article, um, um, some artwork of uh, the Krakatoa eruption here, just during the eruption and then actually continued to most of this island was it kind of exploded away uh, during Krakatoa. Um, so Krakatoa took place in 1883. Uh, it's a volcanic island in Indonesia. It had been dormant for over 200 years. Uh, and it's around about four times the power of Mount St. Helens eruption. Uh, it was heard, the blast, the noise of the eruption was heard thousands of kilometers away in a place like Australia. And 800 meters, um, you know, 1300 feet or so, 1400 feet of the cone was blown away during uh, the eruption. It's a volcanic island. A lot of that collapsed into the ocean, displaced the water, created a tsunami wave, and that caused a huge wave which, which flooded uh, coastal areas on the, on the islands around uh, Krakatoa, causing the people thousands of, of, of deaths from drowning. 33,000 people died. Uh, also, 3,000 people killed by ash and gas itself directly from the, the blast. Caused global cooling and colorful sunsets. Uh, the famous, um, you, some of you may know this, you know, if you, if you know some of your artwork, um, the, this, this is called The Scream, this painting, The Scream, uh, painted by Edvard Munch, um, is from, uh, I believe, either Sweden or Norway, I think Norwegian. And this scream, the famous uh, image of the scream, though, has the red skies. And I don't think uh, Monk actually realized what had happened on the other side of the planet just prior to this, which was the eruption of Krakatoa. And all those, all those particulates that went up in ash that got into the stratosphere, they actually went all the way around the globe and caused these very colorful sunsets, hence the, the, the red skies, which happened. You know, he painted that during the year um, of the Krakatoa eruption, which I always think is kind of cool. OK, different famous uh, eruptions to scale. Mount St. Helens, a cubic kilometre material. Krakatoa here in, in terms of volume, 18 cubic kilometres. On the right, Vesuvius, around about three kilometres. Um, I said um, Tam Tambora is the most explosive eruption in history. But if you go back, kind of uh, most of explosive eruption in the last 5,000 years, say, the so kind of prehistory happened in New Zealand, which was a Taupo um, eruption of AD um, 186. And um, that was massive. We're talking almost 100 cubic kilometers of material going out. They can get bigger. I'm not going to actually say much about something called super volcanoes, uh, but super volcanic eruptions are even bigger. We're talking a thousand or more cubic kilometers of material. And that occurs very rarely, but places like the Yellowstone in Wyoming have super volcanic eruptions occasionally um, in, in sort of the geologic history. Fortunately for us, very rare. Um, but they do happen. You can put all these types of eruptions, how explosive they are, um, on something called the Volcanic Explosivity Index, here, or the VEI scale. And if you look at the, the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, it shows um, um, here on the right, um, cloud height in kilometers, um, and historic eruptions basically get less and less and less uh, as you get more explosive. And there's different styles of eruptions, uh, Stromboli and after uh, Italian um, volcano V1 to 3, Volcanian kind of 3 to 5 VEI scale, and then very, very high eruption columns of a Plinian type eruption um, with these high um, VEI numbers. Uh, also eruption styles, just showing some examples here. Um, so eruption types, here's some fissure eruptions, just highlighted here, like in Hawaii. Here the shield volcanoes, sorry, fissure type like in Iceland. Um, fissure eruptions like you get in um, Hawaii. Um, ones which are dominated by pyroclastic flows, such as the uh, Pelean eruption of uh, Mount Pele on, on Montserrat. Um, and cinder cones on the right with their, their, their broad um, uh, 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 and steep sided uh, large crater. And then your typical kind of classic um, Mount St. Helens type eruption here called Plinian or Stratovolcano eruption on the left there. 
Uh, example again in your own time to look through, but a nice table of, of historic notable worldwide volcanic eruptions here with the VEI scale, number seven being the most explosive. So just to point out a couple of them, um, there's 7,000 years ago, uh, so 5,000 BC was Cradle Lake, another VEI seven, this Taupo, uh, largest eruption in the last 5,000 years, there's, there's Tambora, 1815. Um, some other ones, um, Mount St. Helens, four to five on the VEI scale. Uh, Mount Pinatubo, second largest uh, eruption of the 20th century um, in the Philippines um, in 1991. Kilauea, it's been active since 1983, constantly, most active uh, um, uh, um, with continuous eruption um, on Earth, most active volcano. Okay. Um, finally, last couple of slides, uh, where do you tectonic settings? So going back to plate tectonics, uh, I'll just mention the terms of type of volcano. It's very much driven what type of lithosphere, what type of crust are you generating the magma from? That's what it's down to. So uh, firstly, mid-ocean ridge uh, or divergent plate boundaries. So example, on the, the um, mid-ocean ridge of the uh, mid-Atlantic ridge, here produced basaltic magma formed in, in the asthenosphere, the upper mantle. Uh, but low viscosity, often uh, fissure style eruptions when they do occur like somewhere like um, uh, um, Iceland. Um, next, um, subduction zone and hotspots. So these are um, second and third of the three types. So subduction zone um, volcanoes, these produce your classic composite volcanoes or your stratovolcanoes such as in the Cascades associated with convergent plate boundaries, especially associated with subduction zones. Yeah, always subduction zones are convergent. And finally, intraplate volcanoes. So intraplate volcanism occurs always really associated with hotspots. So when you get this, this single point source of magma, magma pl plume underground, that will result in a volcano above, the, above that plume as a, something called a hotspot. If that occurs in under or within um, oceanic crust, oceanic lithosphere, we call it an oceanic hotspot, and you get shield volcanoes forming from this basaltic rocks. If it forms beneath uh, basically magma generated from continental crust, so high silica, uh, granitic rocks, we have calderas forming with rhyolitic lavas, um, such as Yellowstone in Wyoming or Long Valley in, um, in California, Southern California. Uh, last slide, put the, all that back onto that diagram we, we, look, we looked at at the beginning. Um, you can now kind of hopefully understand why you get the different styles of volcanoes, be they associated with mid-ocean ridges, low viscosity shield volcanoes, plate boundaries, especially subduction zones and convergent boundaries, and you get these stratovolcanoes or composite cones and acidic lavas. And finally, very explosive hotspot volcanism. Here it gives an example of um, one, um, uh, for example, in Yellowstone, and you produce riot caldera type eruptions, very explosive eruptions uh, here because you're, you're melting, the magma has been generated from continental lithosphere, which is very, very um, high in silica, therefore very viscous, therefore very explosive. All right, that was Volcanoes Part 1. Uh, thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time in the second part of the lectures, second one of the lectures on volcanoes. Thanks.